Hello, and welcome to another episode of Scenery with Sir Astro. In this video I'll be creating some simple rocky terrain, which I'm loosely basing on the environment of the Star Wars planet Geonosis, but the terrain will be generic enough to work for most rocky or desert settings, and there are of course limitless ways you could paint the scenery to suit your purposes. To build the terrain I'll be using mostly the same basic resources used in episode 1. In summary, I'm going to be carving up pieces of styrofoam, which I'm going to glue together with hot glue along with some optional pieces of slate and bark to create some textual interest. I'll then be filling in some gaps and providing some texture using sculptor mould and some basing paste, before priming and painting the rocks to match the gaming mat I'm going to be playing on. As with my Endor themed scenery, I'm once again using a gaming mat by Deep Cut Studio, this time the Red Planet gaming mat, which I'll provide a link to, along with all of the other products used, in the video description. Let's begin. I'm going to begin by creating my basic shapes using some of the 2cm thick blue styrofoam left over from my last project, and I'm using a hot wire cutter by GoChange. The kit comes with a 10cm bow style cutter along with two one style cutting attachments, which are handy for engraving and for boring holes. There's also some extra wire and a stand for propping the tool up. I've chosen to begin by creating some simple spires, by firstly drawing out a series of circles decreasing in size as I go. The size of the circles will of course define the size of the spire you're making. This particular spire ended up being my largest, measuring 10cm across at the base, but I also made some smaller spires ranging down to around 5cm in diameter. When cutting the foam it's important to work in a well ventilated environment, and I'd strongly suggest wearing a breathing mask. I'm now cutting the circles out with a hot wire cutter, and I'm naturally taking care not to injure myself as I go. The cutting doesn't have to be especially neat, partly because I'm aiming for a somewhat uneven and textured look, but also because we can do some more refining of the finished shapes in a moment. I'm now carving the point for the spire. Next I'm going to stack the circular blocks to check that I'm happy with the size and general structure. And I'm now gluing the blocks together using a hot glue gun. As mentioned, this turned out to be my largest spire built using 12 blocks in total and measuring around 36 centimetres or 14 inches, but I also built some smaller spires such as this one which uses just 7 blocks of the styrofoam. I'm now using the hot wire cutter to firstly rough the texture up a bit by creating a series of indents. I'm also cutting away at the ledges formed by the individual blocks to disguise the underlying structure. You could of course make your spire as smooth or as rough as you like. The next thing I've chosen to do is stick down some pieces of slate rock to the base of the larger spire, which I bought quite cheaply from a garden centre. You may need to carve into the base to create a shape that allows adequate contact. I'm once again sticking these down with the glue gun. I like to add the slate partly to introduce some natural textures and variation, but I also like the extra bit of weight it lends to the scenery, which helps prevent it from sliding around the battlefield. I might also stick down some cork bark to create some further textural variation. This completes the basic structure of the large spire. To finish the stage off, I'm now using the wand attachment to carve some of the characteristic slits we sometimes see on Geonosis. Music 
using the exact same tools and techniques, I'm now creating some more general rocky formations. If you're wondering how strong these bonds are, you may be surprised. Because I'd like plenty of raised platforms for the troops to climb onto, I'll be using mostly flatter pieces of slate on the top to allow the figures to stand. There is of course no limit to the scale of the scenery you could build by stacking up layers of the 2cm thick styrofoam. However, to more quickly create some larger structures, I've chosen to use something a little thicker. This is 10cm thick black styrofoam, which behaves exactly the same as the blue or the pink. I bought a single piece of this from eBay measuring 600 by 800 mm and ended up with plenty to spare for future projects, so you don't need to buy such a large piece. And to help me cut through the styrofoam, I'm using a more heavy duty hot wire cutter by Proxon. This is purely to help speed things along however, and you could of course achieve the same look and scale by simply stacking up multiple layers of the thinner styrofoam. You can see I'm starting out each piece by playing around with the general form with rough blocks, a bit like a sketch. For this particular piece I wanted to create a short passageway beneath the outthrust rock. And I'm still using the smaller wire cutter to create some ridged textures. Along the way, I'll be making some fairly deep cuts to create some more interesting shapes and disguise the bland geometry of the underlying blocks. And once again using the wand attachment to bore some holes and slits into the rock where the Geonosians may have built their hives. There's definitely a raw creativity and childlike fun to be had by playing around with different ideas whilst building scenery like this. Here once again you can see me sketching out a rough idea with bare blocks, which I'll then carve into something more interesting and irregular.
Along with the slate, I'm also gluing down some more rounded pebbles, just for the sake of a little variety. Here you can see how things look at the end of the main assembly stage. All in all, I created 8 pieces of scenery during the shoot, plus 3 which I made whilst practicing, which I think is more than enough for gaming purposes, and around half this amount would actually be fine. Whilst aiming to create something that's aesthetically pleasing, I've also created plenty of raised, reasonably flat areas on multiple levels, to ensure there's enough space for entire units to comfortably stand, opening up options during gameplay. With the main assembly complete, we're now ready to add some texture. For that, I'm going to once again be using Sculptor Mold, although there's a wide range of things including fillers and spackling paste that you could use to do this. All we do here is mix in some water until we have something that looks like thick porridge. And I'm now simply working this onto the scenery, covering most of the areas of flat styrofoam, but avoiding the natural texture of the rock and cork. Along the way, I'm taking care to fill in the gaps between the different elements to create an organic, seamless look. If whilst you're working you find the sculptor mould begins to dry in the pot, we can simply mix in some additional water. This can take up to a full day to dry depending on how much water you mixed in. Here I've chosen to use a sculptor mould to build up some ridges running around the circumference of one of these spires. As the sculptor mould begins to dry, it becomes a lot easier to smooth out. I'm also creating some thin vertical ridges around the base of the spire. Once fully dry, it's worth checking over the scenery and brushing off any small, loose bits of sculptor mould that are likely to easily come away. I'm then going to provide one final textural element using Vallejo's brown earth basing paste, which has quite a fine gritty finish. I'm applying this with an old brush to fill in any unwanted gaps which I failed to smooth over with the sculptor mould, and provide a little texture to any remaining exposed bits of styrofoam. This is also handy for filling in any gaps in the sculptor mould that may have appeared due to shrinkage whilst drying. I'm now going to paint the scenery, and here you should of course go with whatever tones you feel best matches your terrain to the table you're playing on. I'm going to firstly airbrush on Vallejo's Leather Brown Surface Primer. Unlike the black and the white primers, this only comes in 17ml bottles, which means I ended up getting through 6 to cover all of my scenery. I'm then going to spray some Armour Brown into all of the shadowed areas, followed with some Light Rust and Orange Rust which I'll be spraying more from above. 
I'm then going to do some dry brushing to pick out the texture using Citadel's Tyrant Skull, although any cream or ivory tone would be fine. And finally, I'm going to use some thinned red ink to adjust the overall levels of red and introduce some tonal variation. Here I'm applying the Leather Brown Primer, which we naturally want to get into every nook and cranny. Along the way, I might switch pieces to allow the first area covered to dry, before returning to finish the remaining areas which I was previously holding on to. I'm now using the Armour Brown to hit all of the shadowed areas, including all of the small cracks and recesses. It may help to hold the scenery upside down to provide a kind of inverse zenithal highlight with this. the spires, you may well end up covering almost the entire model with this. Next I'm spraying my light rust from a roughly overhead angle, although I'm still hitting most of the sides. I'm now applying the more vibrant orange rust, more or less directly from above. This gives us some quite effective zenithal highlights, along with some attractive variations of hue. Next I'm going to dry brush on the Tyrant Skull with an old makeup brush to sharpen some of the textures and edges using a mostly downward motion. This may seem a little extreme, but we'll be integrating things together with the red ink in a moment. Finally, I'm going to dilute some red ink with around 50% water and a little airbrush thinner. The exact proportions aren't that important, as long as we're able to control the flow of the colour to produce quite a fine filter, as the effect produced could be quite strong. Here on this test paper, you can see we're able to produce some quite subtle shifts of red. I'm now spraying this over most of the scenery, but I don't mind if the concentration varies somewhat to give some gentle variations in the levels of red. As one final optional touch, I've chosen to provide a light sprinkling of Army Painter's brown and black battleground, just to the areas of rocky ground. So here I'm brushing on some thinned PVA glue, which can also be sprayed onto the entire model afterwards for protection. And I'm now providing just a light selective application of the grit. This is a small touch, but one that I feel helps better match the scenery to the gaming mat. And this completes the rocky terrain. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you have enjoyed the episode. As usual, you'll find a full product list in the video description, along with all of the places I can be found on social media and Spotify. My sincerest thanks go to the amazing and generous patrons for funding these videos. I simply couldn't do it without their kind support.
Join me again soon and happy painting.